Hello, everyone. I am Angelique Leggett, and as Troy mentioned, I am the president of the African American Caucus here in Johnston County. Uh, I have been um, a paralegal since 1999, and I've worked with the Attorney General's office for some time. I'm currently in law enforcement, but I still like to delve into the law, um, voter suppression, uh, qualified immunity, things of that nature. And this is why I'm presenting this today in hopes that you could possibly um, learn something, share it with your friends, and um, let's move forward with this voter suppression and the acts that the GOP is actually trying to do. So the, the first question I have is, what's the most prevalent form of, prevalent form of voter suppression in North Carolina? That is going to be the question of the day pretty much throughout this train. And I want you guys to consider this question as we go through it. And um, if you want to answer, please feel free to answer in the chat what you think. And at the end, we'll have a short interaction and discussion about the voter suppression PowerPoint, as well as some of the laws that are in place or trying to be implemented this year. Do I have any questions now? Okay, so I'll start. Again, the, the African American, I'm from the African American Caucus of the Johnston County. However, this is being presented on the, under the North Carolina Democratic Party. I believe we have the president of the African American Caucus here, Felita O'Donnell. She's here with us today as well. This presentation is talking about the fight against voter suppression in North Carolina. And I'm, I'm very familiar with Mother Rosanelle Eaton, and I'm not sure if you all are. But she said something that's um, very fitting for this presentation. She says, our rights are being taken away from us and we should not stand idle. I want to also present this voter um, suppression on her, in her memory, because she has been fighting this for a very long time. And we did see her as the plaintiff in one of the lawsuits that got, um, that actually we'll, we'll discuss in this, in this presentation. Next. So how did this voter suppression, voter um, laws all come about? And it all came about with the civil rights action. In 1963, JF Kennedy asked Congress for a comprehensive civil rights bill. And this was during his radio and TV speech where he recognized that this was a serious issue, the discrimination, the inequality of um, Blacks. He realized that this was such a serious issue and he begged people on TV and radio to encourage their congressmen to pass this legislation. But he also acknowledged that this was a moral issue as well. There was um, massive resistance to the desegregation. He had to um, have National Guardsmen deployed to Alabama just to walk the girls to school. And after his speech, there was the murder of Megar Evers. So this made it this act imperative and imminent. As we all know, President Kennedy was assassinated in November of 22nd, um, 1963. And that is when Lyndon May Johnson came in to the forefront. He was the vice president at that time. And he became president and he pushed that bill. He started securing the votes. He had, um, now that his records are out, um, his presidential telephone records and things like that, we could see all of the hard work President Johnson really put into the Civil Rights Act, the bill and voter, um, voter, voter rights. So in 1964, Congress passed the public law which was effectively the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. The key provisions of that act was it prohibited discrimination based on the race, the color, religion, sex, national origin. It prohibited discrimination in hiring, firing, and promoting. It prohibited discrimination in public accommodations and federally funded programs. And it extending, extended voting rights to all Americans. Title I of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 actually 
was specific for voter registration. And um, this is the one that prohibited a voter from being rejected for non-material errors on application. And it actually outlined the specific requirements for literacy, literacy tests. Key provisions of that, it, it strengthened the enforcement of the voter voting rights. It ensured states with a history of discrimination and Jim Crow laws sought federal approval for changing voting rights laws. And it directed attorney generals to challenge the use of poll taxes for state and local elections. Voter suppression, what is it? What does voter suppression look like? Who benefits from voter suppression? And how does voter suppression negatively impact the future? Those are the three questions we'll consider as well. Voter suppression defined as the deceptive effort, efforts by others to prevent people from voting by challenging court rulings, intimidating voters, closing polling places, misinformation or disinformation, which are totally two different things, and gerrymandering. The laws are contested. Under the Voting Rights Act of 1965, there was section 4B and 5 noted that any states that had a history of discrimination and voter suppression couldn't pass election legislation without the federal government assessing the law's effect on voters. It was, it was considered preclearance. Well, in 2013, Shelby County, Alabama challenged those sections in the US Supreme Court. Shelby, Shelby County pretty much said, we're going to show that we no longer need this um, statute, this 4B and 5. And they offered evidence to show that the Voting Rights Act had helped close gaps in voter registration and turnout rates. It posited that the blatantly discriminatory evasions of the law were rare, stated that minority candidates held offices at higher rates than ever before. I don't know when I took it out. Just a second. So in the Shelby case, it continued that the voter eligibility test had not been used for close to 40 years, and the act created an extraordinary federalism and cost burdens to preclearance. Their position, the Civil Rights Act of 1965, sections 4B and 5, could not be justified. The Supreme Court looked at it, considered it, and they implemented a permanent injunction on the enforcement of 4B and 5. They indicated that it was, they ruled it was unconstitutional. Justice Roberts wrote that it gave the federal government unprecedented power over state legislatures with specific goal. The provisions had accomplished its goal. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, so I'm just going to go off for, for a minute and say that the 4B and 5 dealt with a lot of states. It wasn't just Alabama. North Carolina, we had some cities that were involved in that. Actually, um, North Carolina was part of the Shelby County suit as well. We have states that did not, that maintained those Jim Crow laws, those voting uh, restrictive laws against people. And the federal government was truly trying to um, stop it. However, when they went forward with this case, what the, what the Supreme Court said was, you don't have any evidence today. You don't have any evidence today to show that these rules and these numbers from 50 years ago still apply today. So it was on the attorney general that he did not um, provide the information that they were requesting. And that is really why this, uh, this rule was uh, ruled unconstitutional. They were looking at 50 year old guidelines and formulas to maintain the federal government's authority over state voting laws. So be, be clear with this 4B and 5. Yes, minorities were being elected at a higher rate. Yes, things were rare. Um, but that could also go to the fact that people weren't recording those adverse actions as much before um, then. So um, as we move forward, we'll see that we're kind of going back to this anyway, 
but um, we'll go to the next slide. Within 24 hours, Alabama required photo identification to vote. They closed driver's licenses, license offices in black areas. They pushed for proof of citizenship and the dozens of polling places that were closed were in minority areas. They even hamstrung a get out the vote group. And we're seeing that in a lot of legislation today where they're asking people, they're telling people you're not allowed to offer water or snacks if people are on a line. Alabama purged their voter rolls and they did not publicize that the felons who, um, who had served their sentence, they would be able to vote again. Voter intimidation is protected by the United States Code, which is a, fe a federal code. 18 USC 594 says that no person shall intimidate, threaten, coerce any other person for the purpose of interfering with the right of that person to vote or to vote as he may choose. We see voter intimidation tactics by them. Um, we have individuals that aggressively question voters about their citizenship, their criminal record, and other qualifications to vote in a manner intended to interfere with that voter's rights. They falsely present themselves as election officials, and they spread false information about voter requirements, displaying false information or misleading signs about voter fraud and the related criminal penalties. And they also harass people, specifically non-English speakers and voter of, um, voters of color. This is a slide I want you all to be mindful of. This is always active. Uh, if you see something, a voter intimidation, if you see people who may, um, who you believe may be attempting to violate people's voting rights, be cognizant of this number, but also be aware that that person um, may be violent. So you don't want to approach that person. You just want to record safe distance. You wanna be a good witness for any future action. So if you see anyone being harassed, record it, everyone has a cell phone. If you see people in uniforms with the weapons and things like that, you record that, report that to the local police department. Make sure that it's well documented so that the Democratic Party and Common Cause and all of the ACLU and NAACP will have enough evidence to go in front of a court to say, hey, these things were happening in this area. If you see police cars, um, in some areas, the police officers are, are actively engaged in suppressing the vote of minorities. Get, keep a safe distance, make sure you get the um, police officer's badge number if possible, um, the uniform, make sure you take a, a picture of the patch. The patch is the most important thing. And um, any numbers that may be on the police vehicles, you may wanna get a copy of that. Again, just using your, your cell phone to get video, record things for evidence in a future proceedings, be the best thing to do in those situations. Please do not approach anyone. You don't know what their intent is. Um, and you don't want to be, um, you just wanna be a witness, not a victim. Go ahead. With poll closures, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights found that states claimed polling place closures were intended to save money. And this is what was happening in Alabama when they closed all the polls and they had to reopen them because they said, oh, no, we need to save money. But they only, they only closed those polls in specific areas. So that was a, a sure sign that it wasn't so much about the money. It was about the voters um, that they were trying to disenfranchise. And these closures, we don't really know about. We don't hear it on the news. It's not something that the news is um, reporting constantly. So we need to be out there and aware of our polling locations, the status of our polling locations. And it shouldn't just be a situation where it's the presidential um, race, let's do this now. This is going, this has to be a constant thing. We have to continually 
make sure our polling locations are open and available to our people. Um, we have to make sure they're ADA qualified. We have to make sure they are staffed properly. We need to ensure continually that we will not be disenfranchised when we have to vote in our two and four year elections. Next slide. The long lines. These long lines are the reason why they have implemented legislation in Atlanta, in Georgia, um, and Alabama with not handing out water and, and food for those who are waiting on the long lines. And again, this all goes back to disenfranchising a certain um, set of, of voters. And the long lines come from those poll closures. So again, I wanna reiterate, we need to be on these. We need to know what polls are open to us and available to us continually ensuring they are not closing these things without our knowledge. Next slide. I indicated earlier misinformation and dis disinformation were two things. Um, misinformation, next slide. Misinformation is incorrect or misleading information. It's designed to confuse people about the voting pro um, process. Misinformation decreases voter confidence. Disinformation, next slide, is false or misleading information that is spread deliberately to deceive. It's a subset of misinformation. And it, it too is designed to confuse people and it too decreases voter confidence. We'll get into the biggest thing now, which is gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is a practice intended to establish an unfair political advantage for a particular party or group by manipulating the boundaries of electoral districts, which is most commonly used in first past the post electoral systems. It happens often, but mainly during redistrict redistricting. This is a video, Troy. I can't hear it. You can't hear it? No. Let's see if that works. The Rorschach test. The districts set by state legislatures hear it now? have long been bent for yes, partisan yes. advantage, but recently Republicans have reaped most of the rewards. Consider the 2012 election where the GOP scored 33 more seats in the House. Remember, John Boehner is still the speaker, even though Democrats earned a million more votes in those House races. That gets us back to those strangely shaped ink blots, which have one public policy professor seeing red. Every fall I speak to five or six members of the British Parliament that come over uh, to shadow members of Congress. And one of the things I have to explain to them is, here's how you get elected to the House. I, I have, you know, I, I see these shocked looks on these British faces. And one time one stood up and said, well, that's terrible. That's not the voters choosing their representatives. That's the representatives choosing their voters. And I said, precisely, you now understand how we do it. The Republican Party took over Michigan several years ago, and they drew what was called Scorpions in the Bottle, a district that brought together two entrenched Democratic incumbents. So then the choice for those incumbents is move from the family home of 30 or 40 years into a new district or fight with another incumbent Democrat in a bloody, bloody primary. If you're in a 50-50 district or a district where Democrats are 40% of the electorate, Republicans are 40% of the electorate, then you're worried about those moderates in the middle and you want to cater to them. And you might say, you know what? 
I'm not going to vote 100 percent with the NRA all the time. I'm going to be for background checks. Uh, I'm a moderate Republican. If you're, if you're in a district that's designed to elect you or to elect a Republican, that you don't worry about the general election, you don't worry about reaching out to the moder moderates. What you worry about is if I vote once with Obama on any big issue or even a small issue, it could be the end of my career. There are a few places that do it right. Uh, Iowa, for example, uh, they district their congressional seats and their state house by a nonpartisan judicial commission. So they don't pay attention to whether these are Democrats or Republicans. They just pay attention to does this shape seem to make sense? Does it fit the existing political boundaries? Uh, is it, does it respect sort of the history of this seat? And that is the way we should be doing it in all 50 states uh, because it would actually help our democracy a lot. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, lay down on... There you go. So, now that we've seen that video, and, and e even though that video was based out in 2013, it's still relevant today, especially when you're looking at um, a Senator Manchin being uh, the only Democrat in a very red state and his votes and things like that um, kind of explains that, doesn't justify it, it just may explain. Um, some people are um, intuitively connected to power and um, sometimes when that's the case, um, things could go um, a little different than, than what one would expect. So we, we all wanna be mindful of, of that too. Um, so moving, moving right along, um, Supreme Courts have, uh, go back one, one, one uh, slide for me, Troy. Supreme Court has no um, power in, in ger gerrymandering for states. The Supreme Court, it likes to stay out of it. We've seen two cases, the Lamont v. Benesic and Arucho versus Common Cause and federal courts, all of them said, we lack jurisdiction, this is a state this is a state issue. And this is what happened in North Carolina in, in 2019, North Carolina, Common Cause versus Lewis. And the next slide. So this is the Common Cause versus Lewis. This is one of the big lawsuits. Everyone heard about it. This is when they said gerrymandering, you guys literally intended to disenfranchise a group of people. And I was fortunate enough um, that um, the Honorable Justice Brian Collins gave me a few minutes of his time this past week to discuss this case um, in short and why he came up with this conclusion. And as you can see here, he says that on uh, the, uh, the Wake County Superior Court unanimously struck down North Carolina's Curran leg legislative map as unconstitutional. And it didn't refer to any federal law. The court ruled that the map violated the state constitution's guarantees of free elections, equal protection, freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly. The decision cited the whole fellow's files as evidence of the goal of the Republican Party to maximize the number of Republican seats in the General Assembly. The Superior Court gave the North Carolina General Assembly two weeks to draw up a new map prior to the 2020 election. The Senate President, the Senate President pro tempore, Philip Berger announced that the Republican caucus would comply with the ruling and would not appeal to the North Carolina Supreme Court. So they were, they, they said they would adhere to that ruling. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get that um, map approved for the 2020 election. Go ahead to the next one. In this case, the Supreme Court wrote that the district maps were unconstitutional and if they are drawn with a predominant intent to favor voters aligned with one political party at the expense of other voters, called the state's congressional map the most extreme and brazen partisan gerrymander in American history. 
and it cited the Republican legislative leaders who established partisan advantage as an official criterion and directed that the map be drawn to maintain the current partisan makeup of North Carolina's congressional delegation. As of today, there are over 200 bills in 43 states that are seeking to change voting laws. The majority of them are restricting, some are expanding. Unfortunately, the direction of the bills are consistent with political parties. So Republicans are trying to restrict and suppress bar people from exercising their vote, right to vote. And Democrats are on, are on the right side of the law today and they're fighting to expand the rights. As you can see, um, the restrictive votes requiring identification, purging voters, restricting same day, closing poll lo locations, restricting the voting by mail, decreasing early voting hours. And the other party is doing the complete opposite. They want to expand the thing. So they want to um, have it so that people do not require identification to vote. Go ahead. Holmes v. Moore, this is North Carolina. These are the North Carolina cases that are currently active. Um, we're waiting on decisions for these cases. We have the Holmes v. Moore, it questioned the statute North Carolina wanted, to, um, wanted in place. And the reason we did not need identification to vote in 2020 was because this case was stayed. That, that statute they were trying to put in place um, required um, ID. And because of the uh, judges and staying that, we were able to, um, yeah, we were able to vote without ID for 2020. And we're coming up on this, so there's going to be a decision soon, but we need to be mindful of that. And then we have the one with North Carolina NAACP. Go back one. That was um, the burger. Um, and Tim Moore, they were sued in their official uh, capacity. This is the one the Honorable Justice uh, Collins spoke to me about. And he, and he, and these are the words he said to me again. He, and he wrote this in the ruling. An illegally constituted General Assembly does not represent the people of North Carolina and is therefore not empowered to pass legislation that would amend the state's constitution. Now, when he said illegally constituted General Assembly, what he was referring to was the fact that they had written the laws, they had written the maps, um, and they were found to be, you know, gerrymandering and violation of rights. Well, in that time, those were those people were voted into those positions. So Justice Collins says, well, you know, if you hadn't done this illegal act of gerrymandering these, you wouldn't be in the General Assembly. So you don't have a right to make any amendments to the state's constitution until we figure out what's going on with this entire gem, um, gerrymandering ge general assembly and redistricting thing. So that, that was the bottom line to that. And that's why that case, that case is still pending as well. To the next one. North Carolina had a Senate bill, S-722. This one is active and they are moving on this one. I spoke with the executive director, um, Bell, from the Board of Elections and she provided me this information. She said, this is one of the most important things because if we do not pass this bill, you're going to have, again, just what the Honorable Collins says, um, illegal constituted ind individuals in power. So they're pushing that if we do not have the correct map, then that city would be able to push back their voting um, election times or something else. So they're giving cities an option to say, well, we don't have this information, this redistricting boundaries aren't um, complete or accurate we're not going to have the elections now. So this is this is beneficial for us as well because you don't want um, people who over you that you didn't vote for. And that's what you, you get a lot of times with this gerrymandering. Go to the next slide. 
So this restrict, redistricting, redistricting, sorry, that's a difficult word sometimes. In the United States, each state has a number of members of the House of Representatives proportional to the state's population determined by the U.S. Census conducted every 10 years under Article I of the United States Constitution, with each state having at least one representative, regardless of its population size. A state that has more than one representative must redistrict after the new census to ensure that each district continues to have an equal number of people. So this is why it's so important, um, Bill S-722, because they put the census back due to COVID and things like this. So we need to be mindful that COVID pushed some things back. We need to make sure our rights are protected. We need to make sure um, the maps are drawn pr properly. And that's one of the things S-722 will do for us. It will protect North Carolinians from the, the COVID and the pushback of the census. Next. Okay, it's it's... As I said, it's in the committee, it's important. Um, it needs to be voted on before 2022. And I just urge you all to call your legislatures in, in the House and in the Senate and ask them to support this bill. Um, before I talk about For the People Act, I wanna go over one, one other bill that a lot of people were, were talking about, the S, the 326 bill. And that was the bill that was requiring identification um, a lot a lot of North Carolinians thought that it was going to be um, passed. It was uh, pretty much going through. That bill has been taken off out of the committee. So um, they're not considering it anymore. And that's because they did, they wanted to require everyone to have identification, said, no, that's not fair. There's a court case in, in right now. Why don't we wait until the court ruling? And at that time, the GOP, and that put this S-326 bill together, they were willing to allocate $5 million for IDs. You know, I, I, I see $5 million going to a lot of other things, um, education for one, but they wanted to give $5 million for ID. Um, so that bill is off the table right now. It's not being considered. So that's one less thing we have to worry about with the North Carolinians, um, North Carolina's GOP, all right? So with this For the People Act of 2021, this is the US federal bill. This is the bill that President Biden wants to have in place. So we don't have to deal with these states bringing in these, uh, these restrictive bills. So the For the People Act is a bill in the United States Congress and it wants to expand the voting rights, it wants to change the campaign finance laws to reduce the influence of money in politics. It wants to limit partisan gerrymandering create new ethic rules for federal office holders, prohibit misinformation and disinformation, and it gives teeth to enforcement. They had enforcement in the Civil Rights Act, they had enforcement in the Voting Rights Act, but they did not implement the enforcement. It was just on paper. They didn't have a, a unit for enforcing voter rights. This is what For the People Act is saying, this is what we're going to do. So they're, prohibiting voter caging. I don't know if you're familiar with that terminology, but it's when the Board of Elections sends out mail and it comes back as undeliverable, then what does the Board of Elections says? Oh, well, they don't live here anymore. They take that voter off of the rolls. They're prohibiting that. It's also going to prohibit and install safeguards for foreign interference in elections. And I think this past election, we, um, last two elections actually, We've seen what foreign, foreign influence can do and foreign interference can do um, for our US election. So we want to, again, support this. It looks like it's uh, stalling out in um, right now, but we wanna keep, keep it alive. Keep calling your legislators, your senators and the house, call them, let them know this is important. Um, this is important for you. It's important for all of us. And um, we need this bill to pass. Go ahead, Troy. One of the questions was, what, who's benefiting from all of this? And as I said, politicians who want to remain in power. In North Carolina, we faced a serious gerrymandering by the guru, Thomas Hofeller. When he, when he was asked about his goal, he remarked, I think electing Republicans is better than electing Democrats. So I drew this map to help foster what I think is better for the country. Next. 
but what can we do? And I'm sorry, that looks like a, that's very, very light, my apologies. But what can we do? One of them is volunteer, volunteer to um, become a member of a committee to help with the voter um, laws, to help with your polling places, ensuring your polling places are open. Someone to continuously check with the Board of Elections to ensure that they are doing everything that they should be doing and not infringing on people's rights. You need to call your legislators in the House and in the Senate. You need to tell them, listen, we are supportive of this bill and not that one. We have to inform our communities that these things are going on. Not everyone is into politics. Not everyone thinks politics affects them. We still need to go out and touch base with these individuals in our community to let them know that they are important and they need to be heard. And these are the things that are going to affect them. And if they don't, and maybe you can always find something that will influence um, someone. Most of the times you let them know that it's, it's affecting their children in the future and they become more interested. So we wanna make sure anytime we have an opportunity to speak to um, anyone in our community, we want to let them know how these things are, are um, affecting them. Also, you want to you want to keep the legislations that's going forward in mind. You have to you have to be um, more aware of these bills that are coming in. These committees and the politicians that want to remain in power can sometimes throw a, a piece of legislation in a bill um, that's totally irrelevant, but it'll affect us. So we wanna be mindful of what they're doing. We know that what their tricks are. We just have to keep um, actively engaged and in, in following them. And more important, most important is to work with organizing your, your precincts. Your precincts have to be, they have to be organized. So we wanna get out there, find a precinct chair if your precinct isn't organized, you want to create that committee so that you can get one organized. But you have to be actively engaged in this now, before elections, before the election for president in, in three more years. We have to be actively engaged in this now. Next. This is the bottom line. Voter suppression efforts are aimed at making it too difficult, confusing, or risky to vote. Those who want to maintain power by any means necessary or benefiting. Voter suppression hurts us all. Voting is a seat at the table and we need to ensure we claim ours. Any questions, comments, concerns? Troy, you can take over from here. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to either use the chat box or you can also use the reaction button to raise your hand and we can call on you one by one. Mary Kaler. Uh, yeah, I just have a comment. Um, you know, I don't really understand why these voter suppression issues are allowed to be voted on at the state level, because, you know, some states, like, I don't understand why there's not federal control over it. And obviously, you know, uh, I watched the slides and I saw that the Supreme Court tries to stay out of that. But, you know, some states are going to be more Republican or more Democrat than others. And we're usually seeing in some of these, you know, very red states, that's where there's, you know, the voter suppression laws, like don't hand out water or stuff like that. So I really think it should be controlled at the federal level. Thank you for that comment. And again, we, we, we all do, um, because we know how important it is to um, have consistency throughout the United States of America. And that's what the For the People Act is, that's what they're trying to do. But again, as long as the, um, our senators that we've put into power there in Congress delay the vote on that, we're going to have to continuously deal with our state. Um, and, and I think we're affected more when we're in a red state. 
um, we have to deal with our state putting or trying to put these type of restrictive voting um, laws into place. So until we get that For the People Act um, passed, we'll have to deal with that. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Walter Martin? Yes, thank you. One of the, and my, mine is a comment that we often talk about the federal elections, but really uh, the elections that impact us most are our local elections. And, and we seem to lose focus on just how much uh, power that when that our locally elected officials have over us. One of the one of the reasons that is such a press for the uh, people voting rights uh, bill to pass is because what people what local local elected officials have done in the uh, uh, state legislatures and uh, so, and oftentimes in these off-year elections uh, that the turnout is so poor that, uh, that, 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 that is when a lot of the power changes take place. Mr. Martin, that's, that's a valid point. It's, act, it's actually a very good point. And it, um, although it wasn't specific in this um, presentation, the uh, Bill 722 um, deals specifically, it's, it's really dealing with those local elections because it's the redistricting that will affect that local election. Right. So we have bills in place that are dealing um, with um, not the not the presidential race, but our local races, because I think the Democratic Party has been getting out to everyone that, hey, these are the very important races that we need to be mindful of and we need to participate in. And I know for the African-American caucus on the state level, they're working with getting out to our communities and ensuring that our community knows that this is more, this is just as, just as important, just as important as the federal election. So it was, a, it was an excellent um, point you made, Mr. Martin. And we are definitely, as the Democratic Party, we're moving to let people know that those, those two-year elections are, are very important. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Paul Smith had a question, comment, or concern? Uh, yes. Uh, one of the things that, I'm aware of is how hard it is to track this kind of, of process. Uh, it's, 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 it's one of those things, I know for me, I, I can tune in to like North Carolina Policy Watch mm -hmm. uh, and a couple of other sources as well, but it comes across as news and it's hard to know exactly how to respond. Uh, uh, I live in Mars Hill, North Carolina, just north of Asheville, of, of Asheville and uh, all three legislators, both uh, senators and our, uh, our representative are, uh, you know, just lockstep Republican voters. And so uh, it's, but beyond that, I mean, that's specific to, to my community but, uh, but beyond that, it's just hard to track this. And I really appreciate your slideshow and your comments, uh, the you. clarity and, and, and so on, the directness of that. But I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions about how someone like myself uh, can track this kind of thing and uh, be used, use my energy in the best way to make a difference. Mr. Smith, thank you for that question. And um, what I do is every month, I follow up with an email to the Board of Election. And the executive director here is, is you know, she's, she's pretty good. And she lets us know 
um, any changes as um, when updating this presentation, she let me know, you know, 326 is out of there now, but 722 is in play. So I think just having a, a relationship with your board of elections, being present, being actively engaged in the election process includes being having a relationship with your board of electors. So I think reaching out to them, making it a, maybe a routine every month, you just call them, shoot them an email and say, hey, anything that we should know about. Um, because it's not coming out in the news. They're not reporting that. And um, that's the unfortunate thing. Okay. Can I make one other, other comment? Uh, for uh, doing this this past year, I hadn't been involved with the Board of Elections the way I had previously, but I, for several years, uh, I went to their monthly meetings. And, uh, and it was a lot, a lot of the time, it was quite boring. It was very routine stuff. At the same time, what I became aware of was the uh, uh, the care they took in, in, in relation to dealing with specific voter issues. Uh, so, uh, but I hadn't thought about how just, you know, just addressing them specifically on this issue to see if there's anything that they would suggest that I might be able to do. But, uh, but I appreciate that. And, uh, and also just to put in a word, uh, for any of the people listening here or, wa or li watching your presentation, I just encourage you, you, you folks to uh, uh, touch base with your board of elections. They're they're very ordinary people. They're friendly, <laughs> and they're bipartisan. And right. so it's a it's a nice place to see bipartisan activity happening. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for that. And yes, we we want to always acknowledge when there's bipartisan because we know everyone has their own side. But it's, it's good to see um, our citizens, our Americans, our, our elected officials doing what they're supposed to do, doing their job for the people who elected them and not for their own personal gain. So thank you, Mr. Smith, for acknowledging that. Maurice Holland had a question, comment, or concern. Well, I, I have more of a comment and I, I, I've, I had to uh, step away uh, and I was late joining, but there, there's some legacy issues also, uh, you know, around surrounding redistricting or uh, creation of fair districts. And one thing that I know that in Moore County is that all of our county commissioners are elected at large, but they have to reside in a residential district. Mm -hmm. And that applies also to some of our school board positions. Mm -hmm. And I understand in, in Cumberland County, there's a movement uh, that's being headed up by a former mayor where they're trying to, uh, for the city of Fayetteville, they're trying to uh, enact uh, four at-large districts uh, instead of having nine uh, residential uh, wards. Uh, that were single member districts. And I, I didn't know if I'm, anyone has, has thought about that or if it's on the radar, but it makes it very difficult for uh, minority candidates uh, to, to win or, or even uh, you know, minority partisan candidates to win. If um, you have to reside in a certain area, your area might be uh, more conducive to a Democrat winning or a Republican winning, and then you have to run um, countywide where there are other areas that are the opposition party that seem to get a veto. Uh, mm -hmm. So they elect not only their um, representative, but also they have a veto over everyone else's representative. Uh, Mr. Holland, thank you for that comment. I must admit, I am not um, well-versed in the at-large of Cumberland County. Um, however, I, I have read some case law on at-large. The NAACP has um, actually been an active um, resistance on that. There are some case law for the NAACP when it comes to at-large um, voting and things like that. And although it, it, it may have been on their position of their law of, of discriminatory and, and things like that, I also understand your point, Mr. Holland, if we, if we don't have these at-large um, positions, we may not even have someone um, representative of us. 
So I, I, I'm not very familiar or well-versed in that at large, um, but I do know that it, it's an issue in a lot, of, a, a lot of communities. In Johnston County, actually, we're having um, um, that with the school board and they wanted at-large positions and things like that. So um, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with it. Is anyone here familiar with the at-large at large situation that they could shine some light for Mr. Holland? I'm just not an expert. I, I, I believe that going back to the 80s and 90s that in Lenore County and some other counties down east, they went, they went from at-large to single member districts. Mm -hmm. And I think that Fayetteville did also. And, and now they're trying to go back. And, and you know, it, it, the reason I bring up Fayetteville is because there's a 10 member council, the mayor is an African American, and eight of the eight of the nine council members are African American. Uh, yet, so in essence, the, the big elephant in the room when the mayor was the when the mayor and the former mayor were debating is race. And that if you're gonna take, if, if you've got eight of the nine districts are represented by African-Americans, and then you're gonna combine four of them, then the issue is that uh, it's the, the, un, the unspoken issue is that you're, you're trying to eliminate African-American representation on, on the council. And it's similar to, to what Justin Burr had tried in, with the legislature where with the judicial in, uh, prior to 2018 and that uh, they re, rejiggered all the judicial districts. And it, in the urban areas, it seemed that um, African-American uh, judges were, were double bunked in some cases that they had to run against each other or they had to file for another seat. Um, so I, I'm not gonna belabor the point, but, but that's uh, that was just something that was there that I think is a legacy uh, to uh, Jim Crow. Thank you for that information. Thank you. I see two hands, um, three hands, Troy. I see Pat, Beth, and Walter. I believe Pat was first and then Walter and then Beth. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is Pat Cafferty. I, my, my concern and my question is different than what Maurice just raised. I'm concerned about the redistricting that will occur uh, at the state level for our state legislature and uh, the redistricting that will occur for our federal congressional districts. The federal congressional district redistricting is a particular concern given that we now have one extra congressional seat um, given our population growth. I'm wondering what um, plans does the party have to oppose what will likely be partisan gerrymandering by the Republican legislature at both the state le level and also at the federal congressional uh, district level? Well, I can't speak for the party, Mr. Cafferty. I can only speak on what I've, I've read and um, the research I've done. And right now they are definitely looking forward to um, the rulings on these two cases because one case deals with the statute, one day they, um, one case deals with the constitutional amendment. So when it comes to um, the voter restrictive area of it, I know that portion um, that we're waiting on states. I also know the bill 722 is going to deal with that redistricting and it's also going to deal with the census um, the census count and things like that. I'm not sure if the North Carolina Democratic Party has an answer for you. Um, if there is anyone on that is uh, part of the North Carolina Democratic Party who can answer that for Mr. Cafferty, it would be greatly appreciated. Mr. Cafferty, that is a question that is going to um, I guess it's going to be the question of the day. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Cafferty, I'd also encourage to post that on Socio. Um, most of our executive leadership is on Socio and they will view the wall as well. If you post it in there, I'm sure one of them will um, create a response for you as well. 
Thank you. Next was Walter Martin. Just to uh, mention briefly uh, all the comments that the, uh, a comment that the uh, gentleman raised raised about districts uh, that, that I'm from Johnson County also uh, same place Miss Leggett is from uh, and throughout the county in the uh, in, with the board seats and the uh, county commissioners. Uh, Johnson County is a very uh, red county, and so 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 we have no uh, officials that that were actually voted in on either either board. There are there have been uh, two recently recently appointments to the board of education uh, where where they were Democrats, and the and, and my other point is. As as far as the um, districts or, or or if you're talking about at large, that works better if it's a city. It, it it makes it much more difficult to do if it's if you're if you're talking about county county elected seats because in, because in order for you to have a minority um, um, on on that board. You would probably have to do the gerrymandering, uh, un un unless a section of the of the county had a very large minority population. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Miss Beth Gilman. Yes, um, I live in Asheville, and uh, the legislature has been trying to. Uh, suppressed the Democratic vote in Asheville uh, ever since the Republicans took over. And they do not always use an at-large strategy. What they did to uh, try to get uh, Republican uh, voices, um, elected officials into the county commission was they, uh, they carved it up into uh, districts. So rather than having an at-large vote, which favored uh, Democrats, now there's um, districts, um, and some of the districts have a, a high um, Republican um, um, representation. And so uh, this strategy always depends on, you know, who's where. Um, but it's clearly an effort to um, get Republicans elected and, and change things to uh, make that happen. Thank you, Ms. Gilman. There are two more questions that were posed in the chat. The first one is, should elections in municipalities be delayed before census changes are instituted? That question, if it's, if it's to me, I think it would be, um, I, I think it's the right thing to do. However, I'm not in any position to, um, make sure it's it's done. I'm in the same position um, you are and, and voicing my opinion about it and fighting that they do the right thing. Um, but I definitely think that all, all votes should be counted. And that means that the census information has to be provided and the individuals that live in our communities must be counted. So um, definitely, yes, I, I think they should wait. And another question I saw is from Karen Manship. She asked if there is a bipartisan way to address voter protections. Republicans seem to be concerned about things like dead people voting and about people voting for other people if ID is not required, even if we don't have much evidence for that. Could we agree with them on the principle that we also don't want those things and include things like that, like better data systems, et cetera, in the same bill that also requires more access, restricts gerrymandering, et cetera? Wouldn't that mean they would have no excuse to vote against it? That's a very good question. And yes, you're right. They would have no excuse. However, this uh, our political parties have been fractured um, at a level that I don't think any of us has ever seen in our lives. And I don't, I'm starting to believe it's not so much so of um, what they're fighting for. It's just, I'm not going to fight, 
fight or agree with anything you're saying. I think that's the divisiveness that we have today. Um, how do we how do we fix that? Um, and maybe if we can fix that, maybe if we could be a little more bipartisan, have a more bipartisan mindset when dealing with things, um, maybe we won't have this this terrible fracture that we have um, with our political parties. Because overall, they're both both of these parties are are for the American citizens and the people and to do what's best. I just think that we had a, a previous president that created just a, a heap of, of chaos and distension and um, really divided the country. So let's hope that our current president can bring that back together and um, maybe we won't have these issues. Ms. Gilman, did you have another comment? I do. I think what we're dealing with uh, in um, in the state and in the country is, um, but it's especially apparent, like in with Senate, you know, with filibuster blockades that that started uh, under Obama. It's the zero sum approach, um, which is we win if you lose, and so um, the Democrats are not allowed to to achieve any dem uh, any legislative uh, victories because um, that makes um, them less likely to get reelected. And so the Republicans systematically block everything. So if they do no, not, if they no longer believe in bipartisanship, I don't see how we can work with them. I mean, there are, there are those who claim uh, bipartisanship, but, but um, that's, that's not the overall um, intent. This is quite apparent. Thank you for your comment. Ms. Peggy, did you have a comment that you would like to say? Yes, actually, um, um, I would post this link, but I can't get to it yet. There is apparently a proposal in the state Senate right now for municipalities to delay their municipal elections. Municipalities that rely on districts, like I live in Raleigh, um, our city council is mostly in districts. You vote in your district. And those elections should not be allowed to be held until the census numbers are in because those districts are going to have to be redrawn or uh, adjusted when we get the population numbers. So apparently that's a proposal in the Senate right now. Um, if I can pull up the link, I'll post it before this session's over. It's an article just from the Associated Press. Thank you, thank you, Miss Neal. That's that's the uh, Senate Bill 722. Okay, um, thank that's, you. That's the bill that they're um, asking for them to put it off until the census is coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Writing. Are there any more questions, comments, or concerns before we end the session today? Seeing none, on behalf of the African American Caucus of the North Carolina Democratic Party and the African American Caucus of the Johnson County Democratic Party, and from me as an Eva Clayton Fellow, we thank you for your time and attention today. We hope you guys found this session very informative, and now you have the tools and resources to not only combat voter suppression, but gerrymandering as well. Thank you guys so much for your time. This will cease the breakout sessions for this evening and for today. Um, the next option to attend is our RBG Awards for some of our stellar volunteers and executive officers in the party. That will start around 6 p.m. The link is available on Socio. If you do not find the link, feel free to contact your fellow and they'll be able to get it to you as well. But we thank you so much for attending the session and we hope you have a wonderful evening this evening and a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you too. Yay. Thank you. Great session. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.